my nephew is my favorite person in the entire world. And he's really embarrassed that I'm starting with a story about him. But when he was about three years old, I saw him at the table and he was sucking on an empty two liter bottle of soda. So I loved messing with his head even back then. And I told him that if he inhales too hard, he's gonna blow up like a balloon. And then I totally forgot about that conversation until many, many years later, when he was about nine or 10 years old, I was visiting for Shabbos and he was sitting at the Shabbos table and he was inhaling on an empty two liter bottle of soda. So I'm like, what are you doing? And he said, I'm trying to inflate like a balloon. So my nephew wants me to tell you very badly that he's a fully functioning adult despite my best intentions. And it's actually been watching him grow up that's made me love and be fascinated by the minds and imaginations of children and how they're so open to us as adults explaining their lives to them. Have you ever seen the Rugrats cartoon? It's a cartoon about babies and toddlers of different ages and developmental stages. And in every episode, they're trying to figure out what the world around them means. And they're usually getting it wrong, sometimes funny, sometimes heartbreaking. There's this one episode, they have a dog named Spike. So the parents are talking in the kitchen about bringing in a groomer to groom the dog. And the kids are in their playpen in the living room. They overhear this conversation and think the parents are talking about an executioner to kill the dog. So they're too young to confront this belief with themselves and they're way too young to confront their parents. So what they do is age appropriate. They come up with this whole plot to save Spike's life. <laughs> At the end of this episode, they never know what the truth is because they never talk to the adults. So they leave the episode thinking that they saved the dog's life. And then I imagine 20 years in the future, they're all adults and Spike has long since passed away and they're sitting around their parents' dinner table and one of the adult children talks about Spike. And they're like, hey, mom, dad, do you remember when you tried to kill the dog? <laughs> and, the mo and all the adult children are like, yeah, yeah, you remember? And the parents are like, that never happened. And then the truth is revealed. I love talking to children and can listen to them all day because I love hearing the meaning that they make of the world. I love their myths and their fables, their villains and their heroes. And I believe that it's our responsibility as adults to help them draw meaning from the world that makes them strong, courageous, and loving people. Children learn from us by watching everything that we do. They listen to everything we say, even behind closed doors, and then they model after us. And no matter how well-intentioned our parents were, we all leave our childhood with some Rugrats belief some of them benign, some of them less so, but all of them color our adult perceptions of the world. I'm a therapist and I specialize in sex addiction and sexual abuse survivors. And I'm really lucky because I love what I do every day. It is such a privilege to create private space, safe space and witness people telling their stories, their own myths and fables about themselves and the world around them. And then I get to help them kind of unravel these Rugrats theories and let go of the ones that they hold on to that still create so much pain and hold on and delight in the ones that create their strengths and joys. Working with the Jewish community specifically, but the field in general, has made me look at the Rugrats theories that I share with my clients and the ones that are so different, particularly around issues around body, sex, and sexuality under that huge umbrella of tsnias, modesty. Talking about sex, healthy sex, unhealthy sex, is really hard. People get really uncomfortable. Even I get uncomfortable sometimes. And my work has really forced me to look at how as a person, but specifically as a woman, I've learned about the subjects of sex, sexuality, and body. I think if you would have asked me when I was a child what tsnias, what modesty meant, I would have told you that it's how I should dress and behave in front of men. My elbows were covered, my knees were covered, and I couldn't sing or dance in front of men. All I think I knew about my body is that it had to be hidden. And I see these beliefs also in my clients' lives, this hyper-focus on women's dress and behavior that I believe is a misrepresentation of modesty. I couldn't sing where I want, I couldn't dance where I want, I couldn't dress the way I want, all because a man might be tempted by me. 
And then that hyperfocus changed as I grew up, and when I started becoming marriageable age, I needed to be a size 10 or below, otherwise no man would ever want to marry me. And I don't think that I was conscious of what those rugrat distortions around sexuality did to my own beliefs about my body. My body was not my own. It was not private, it was not holy, it was not for my pleasure. It was on kind of a layaway plan for my husband. <laughs> and then at the same time, even as a child, I had this other belief about Sneas, about modesty, that modesty is about how we as human beings interact with the world around us. It's a positive act, not a cover-up. Like it says in Micah 6, 8, it asks, what does God ask of you to do justice and love mercy and walk modestly with your God? And I believe that this is the original understanding of modesty. It's not the dog executioner, it's the dog groomer. It's the fact that modesty is about bringing justice and love and goodness into the world, not covering up my clavicles. I believe that these rugrat distortions around sexuality impact individuals, families, communities, across gender, across observance level, in the Jewish community and outside of the Jewish community. And I think that they're as globally destructive as they are for the individual, because they create shame, fear, and secrecy. What about some of the rugrats distortions around sexuality that we see in the world around us? Gender stereotypes in the media. What about boys will be boys that excuse men to cheat? Or this idea that women use sex as a weapon and power against men, which really discourage women from creating and respecting their own boundaries. A long time ago, I had a woman from the Jewish Orthodox community who came in for an intake. And she said that she was in because she was a sex addict. So I said, why are you a sex addict? And she says, because I like sex a lot. And so I hear a lot of weird things in my practice. So I'm like, what does that mean? And she said, I like to have sex with my husband three or four times a week. So I'm like, does he mind? And she said no, but that she learned in her Kala class, her bride class, and she's learned from peers that women don't enjoy sex. And so she must have a problem. And this is a rugrats distortion, this belief that women don't enjoy sex as much as men that gets carried around from generation to generation without confrontation or questioning. But what causes me even more pain are the clients, the women who are married to sex addicts, who use Jewish texts to manipulate and imprison their wives. Like this text in Genesis, where Chava is getting her punishment from God, and he tells her that your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And these husbands use this text to force their wives into having sex with them, saying it's their obligation, regardless of how safe they feel in the relationship, or if their body feels like it. And it's usually my pleasure to be the first person who hands them the actual halacha in the text of Talmud Eruvin 100b that says a man is forbidden to compel his wife to have marital relations. And actually, it's the husband's responsibility to make sure his wife is sexually satisfied. I believe it's our responsibility as adults to have an ever-evolving, ever-growing relationship with God and our faith. And that actually means that we have to be open to sometimes painful opportunities to have our rugrats beliefs challenged. We need to start thinking, do these interpretations still work? Are they some childhood beliefs that we need to let go of? Are they still serving us, our family, our children, our community, and our God? When I think of Sneas from an adult lens, I think of what it means for me to walk modestly with my God. And I think about what it means for me to bring love and goodness and justice into this world. And I think of this concept of tzimtzum. It's a belief that in order to create the world, God had to withdraw and contract, not out of hiding and shame, but to allow space for growth. Similar to how an ocean pulls back when it's preparing for a storm to gather its power and energy. I do not believe that modesty is about hiding my body so that men are not tempted by me, or being a size 10 so men are tempted by me. I think that modesty is a form of symptom, a spiritual and emotional self-contraction that allows space for growth and power. 
It's how we live intentionally and congruently inside, matching outside in our dress, our speech, and how we present ourselves in the world. It's how we choose, each as individuals, to walk modestly with our God that creates a space, a private space for our holy, unique selves to be empowered and enlightened and allows room for the power and light of others. I am a Jewish, Orthodox, gay therapist, and I talk about sex all day long. And I, there's not always this room for all parts of myself that feel comfortable. In some parts of the Jewish community that I feel are home, my gay self struggles to feel welcome. In some parts of the gay community, my Jewish self feels the same. And talking about sex addiction at a Shabbos table is a mood killer. <laughs> so how do I perform my own symptom? How do I do a self-contraction that allows me to connect to my most authentic self? It's not hiding as to not offend, but honoring myself through my disclosures. It's making sure that I'm thinking about my intention every day, no matter what world I live in, to not act and hide out of shame, but only for the purpose of connecting to my unique self or the unique and holy selves of others. And that might mean that in my gay world, I'm out about being an Orthodox Jew. And in my Jewish world, that I don't change pronouns from she to he. Either way, I need to make sure every day that I am not pulling back and withdrawing out of shame, but out of a connection. If you, or me, or others are recovering from some Rugrats distortions around sexuality, perform some symptom. Give yourself some sacred time and space to allow yourselves to learn, enjoy, empower, and find beautiful your body. But more importantly, contract so that you can be open to the possibility of a new, gentle, loving lens about your body. If you have children, if you work with children, give them the gift of the gentle lens so that they can maintain their curiosity, their love, their wonder, and their compassion for their self or others. As human beings, our brains are hardwired to fill in the mystery, to fill in all of the gaps, and we choose our own ending if they're not given to us. I think sexuality is oftentimes not only confusing because of miseducation, but lack of education, where we are not teaching children explicitly about their bodies. Maybe it's true that I was taught that sneas, that modesty, was about honoring my body, but because the focus was about covering up, I thought it meant shame and hiding. So I'm asking that we teach our children about their bodies, that we give them the message of covering up and protection, not out of worrying about being provocative or bad or shameful, but returning Sneas to its original form of beauty, empowerment, and ownership. Thank you.